Um, this is a good question. This is kind of fun. Y'all not know I like talking about science history and things like that. What's the first um, man-made chemical reaction? It actually was not really a chemical reaction so much as it was a biological process that humans discovered relatively early on. Um, and when I say relatively early on, I mean when there were no such things as like, villages or cities or even buildings. Um, when when the only hominids were just hunter-gatherer tribes, um, they used to carry around sacks of water. They'd have water skins made out of um, out of animal hides or other other uh, products. And one of the earliest things that they figured out how to do is how to to harvest honey from beehives. And then they would add the honey to their water to make the water taste sweeter and to give them some sugar. They didn't know what the why they liked that. But um, what happened though was that eventually wild yeast started getting into their water sacks as well and it started fermenting. And so fermentation is actually the oldest chemical biological reaction that humanity has known about really um, because they started making what's, what's called mead. Mead is is basically wine made out of honey and water. Um, and in fact, pretty soon after that, they figured out that they could use other fruits mixed in with water. And then they figured out, so probably the first chemical reaction was figuring out how to take starches, like grains and wheats, um, and convert the starch into glucose so that the yeast could digest it. So beer making is actually one of the oldest chemical reactions known to man. Um, and in fact, it's been it's been put forward by a lot of anthropologists. Um, and I think this is still the current thinking on the matter is that beer making is actually the reason that humanity settled down from being hunter gatherer tribes to being in cities and villages. Because as soon as they discovered agriculture and that they could grow grain consistently in one place, they could stay in one place and get grain and make beer with it. Or not something we would recognize as beer, but a fermented grain drink. Um, and so converting the mash process of converting starches into something fermentable is probably the single earliest man-made chemical reaction. Although, again, they didn't know what they were doing. Beyond that, it was probably probably smelting iron ore to make iron. The beginning of the Iron Age would have been one of the earliest pure chemical reactions that had no biology to it, that they somewhat understood what was going on. Um, but kind of an interesting side note. Um, do you know the, I'm trying to think, it wasn't the Phoenicians, but there was the Assyrians, maybe one of those Middle Eastern, um, very early pre-Persia tribes. The Assyrians, wasn't the Phoenicians, it was before them. They actually had a goddess of brewing. Um, the goddess of brewing, Ninkasi, was actually one of the earliest known gods. Was the, the um, who's taken World, World Civ recently? Um, what, what civilization was it that had the code of Hammurabi? Um, does anybody remember that? It's like, you know, earliest version, earliest version of the of a written code of ethics. Mesopotamia. That, there we go. That was the term I was looking for. Mesopotamians were the ones that had the goddess Ninkasi, the goddess of brewing beer. Um, then that was actually in she was one of the most important deities in that culture and had only female uh, priestesses. And it was seen as being a very, very um, and I believe that that the women were the brewers in Mesopotamia, which was really interesting too. It's kind of a that interesting gender dynamics in Mesopotamia compared to um, compared to what we're used to in most of history. All right, let's let's do some equilibrium practice. We've got acetic acid once again. Acetic acid is vinegar, except we don't actually have it as or pure acetic acid. Pure acetic acid is called glacial acetic acid. And glacial acetic acid is about 17 moles per liter. Um, vinegar, just white vinegar that you buy at the grocery store in a jug for you know $2.75 a gallon, um, is 
a solution of acetic acid in water. We can predict what that pH is if we know the concentration and we know what K is for that reaction. So let's practice that. If we know the dissociation constant of acetic acid and vinegar is 1.8 times 10 to the minus five, what is the pH of the vinegar? So start by writing out that reaction and writing out your equilibrium expression. Then start filling out an ice table. Right. Anytime you get a K value, those should be your steps. Write out your reaction, write out your K expression, and go from there. What does our reaction look like? And what are we gonna make? Hydronium and acetate, good. Anytime we're talking about the dissociation constant of an acid, it's always going to be reacting with water to make hydronium, and then the deprotonated form. All right, so. What do we get for our equilibrium expression? What's number one, one rule of equilibrium? Still products over reactants. What's the third rule of equilibrium? Solids and liquids don't count. So our equilibrium expression looks like concentration of acetate times concentration of hydronium over a concentration of acetic acid. We leave off the water because it's a pure liquid. It's not a pure liquid, but because in the equilibrium or in the um, reaction, it's a liquid, so it has a constant concentration. If we're trying to find the pH, what are we trying to find first? What do we need in order to get pH? Hydronium concentration. Right, so we're just trying to do an ice table here. If we can find the equilibrium concentration of hydronium, take the negative log of that and we're done. So our initial 0 0.08572. Stuff you get at the grocery store isn't actually, doesn't actually have that many sig figs. Usually it has one sig fig. It's 5% by, mass and I usually even don't even specify by mass they just say five percent vinegar um but just let's pretend like we have more sig figs today what's our starting concentration for these two do we start with any of them nope technically we start with a tiny amount of hydronium right but within sig figs, we're going to say it's going to be zero.
What's the concentration of hydronium in neutral water? <laughs> what's the pH of neutral water? Seven. Seven. So what's the concentration of hydronium in neutral water? 10 to the minus seven. So, because remember, if pH is negative log of hydronium, we plug in a seven here, solve for concentration of hydronium, we're gonna get 10 to the minus seven. So, 0 0.0000000 is small enough, we can call it zero for the sake of doing an ice table. So then what's our change going to look like? Here's our initial row. What's our change look like? From left to right. Minus X. Doesn't matter here. Technically, it's minus x, but we we don't care about a liquid. Product sides plus x plus x. So at equilibrium, we get x x zero point eight five seven two minus x. Now we can plug that in here. One point eight times ten to the minus. 5 equals x times x over 0.8572 minus x. Plug it into a solver, or k is small, so we can assume x is close to 0. If we assume x is close to 0, We're just going to remove that piece. What do we get for X when we do that? X, okay. 1.5 times 10 to the minus 5. Um, so that doesn't make a whole lot of sense because we had all positive numbers, right? And the square root of this shouldn't give us something times 10 to the minus 5, should it? So probably just a calculator issue. Mm -hmm. um, this makes a little bit more sense because when you square root, this is basically one for the sake of doing a reasonableness check, right? So we're going to multiply both sides by 0.85, which is basically the same as saying 0.1. And then you're going to take the square root of that number. The square root this number should be something in the 10 to the minus 3 range. So this makes a little bit more sense. And we're just taking this. If we're assuming x is close to 0, we're just doing that. That 1.5 times 10 to the minus 5 is probably after you multiply by 0.85. So we're getting there. Is this less than 5% of what we started with? Yeah. What's 10% of what we started with? 0.085, right? Just move the decimal one more spot over. Half of that is 5%. So half of 0 0.08 is 0 0.04. We're less than 0 0.04 by a long ways. So our assumption was valid.
Did anybody plug it into a solver? What do you get if you plug it into a solver? We can't have it as a negative. It's a quadratic though, right? So you should get two answers because there's a quadratic equation has that plus or minus component to it, right? 0 0.0039, okay. So off by one in the last digit, in the last um, significant figure, but that's reasonable, right? That's the same answer as far as we're concerned in this class. Just reiterating that it doesn't matter. You should get the same answer whether you use a solver or if you make this assumption, if the assumption is valid, if X is small enough. So last step, we want the pH. How do we find the pH now? We, we figured out what X is. pH is going to give us, or is going to be what? X is our hydronium concentration. We're just going to take the negative log of X, which should give us something between three and two. Two point two point two? No. Two point six? Uh, two point four. And we always go to the hundredths place when we do the logs, right? So two point four, two point four one. Thank you. I'm pretty okay at getting to at least this digit in my head when it comes to taking logs mentally. I'm not gonna get anything into the I'm not going to pretend like I can take the log and get the tenths place right in my head. All right. So we should be getting the hang of ice tables, right? We've done enough practice. It's the same process every time. The only thing that changes is K, writing out what your expression is and the coefficients, right? The coefficients can make it a little bit trickier, but in general, when you're doing these these equilibrium problems, you should always be thinking ice tables solve for x. All right, let's talk a little bit more. We ended on Monday talking about Le Chatelier's principle. All right, Le Chatelier's principle was that idea that if you start at equilibrium, I hope this is not the most common, the most current version. Hang on. Ah. Um, Le Chatelier's principle was that, that idea that, hang on, let me load the other. Slides here for this part. If you start at equilibrium and then you make a change to temperature, volume, pressure, concentration of any of the components, you're no longer at equilibrium. And the system is going to shift to get back to equilibrium. Give it a second. So we talked about what are some of the consequences of that. Microsoft can go away. So for instance, if we have that classic reaction, that Haber process. That was that historically important 
reaction of nitrogen and hydrogen to make ammonia. All of these are gases. If we're at equilibrium and then we suddenly add more hydrogen, that changes our ratio, right? All of a sudden we have too much product or reactant? Reactant. And our simplest explanation of equilibrium is products over reactants. So if we add extra reactants, the bottom, the denominator is too small on this ratio, right? Which means we need to take some of the reactant and turn it into product. And so you can actually do this experiment. If you look at this graph here, right at up until this time, when more hydrogen is added, everything is, all, is at a ratio relative to each other. And then we did something where we injected extra hydrogen into the system. Hydrogen spikes up and then starts falling back down as we're trying to get back to equilibrium. That extra hydrogen is going to get used up in order to, to get back to the proper ratio of products over reactants. And that means also that we're going to use up some of this nitrogen. The nitrogen was sitting along here just fine, and then we added more hydrogen, and nitrogen has to pay the cost a little bit too. You lose some nitrogen as well in order to get back to equilibrium. And we do wind up making a little bit more product that way too. So this is actually one of, one of the re ways that Fritz Haber was able to, um, to turn this into a viable process was actually by leveraging Le Chatelier's principle. Fritz Haber realized that if you just put hydrogen and nitrogen together at a high enough temperature, you wound up making some ammonia. But it wasn't enough to be actually very useful. It would stop and you would, wouldn't have enough ammonia that you could actually use. Um, Haber realized that hydrogen and nitrogen don't condense until you get down into the, the double digits in Kelvin until you get down into like 70 Kelvin. So really, really cold. But ammonia condenses at about minus, minus 70 Celsius. So much, much warmer. Relatively speaking, that's still pretty cold, but it's a lot warmer than liquid nitrogen temperatures. And so he realized that if you have this reaction, if we drop the temperature, we can get this to turn not to gas, but to a liquid. And that means you effectively remove it from the system. You, he, was, he figured out a way to remove the product from the system as it was being made. So it actually prevented the reaction from ever reaching equilibrium. Because as soon as you made more ammonia, it condensed out as liquid ammonia, and then you could continue this process happening. Um, so it, it was a pretty, it was a pretty big deal. It was more of an engineering feat than purely a science feat. He, the reactions were already well known and the science was already well known for how equilibrium works. He was just the one who figured out how to leverage Le Chatelier's principle um, to can be able to continuously make product uh, instead of just letting it get to equilibrium and just taking that, that small amount of product. It should be noted too, in the interest of not whitewashing historical figures, Fritz Haber was really, really not a pleasant person. Uh, I think, believe after World War I, he was uh, an outspoken advocate for, for the Nazi party in general and Hitler in particular, and wound up in going into World War II supporting the Nazis. Uh, so don't idolize scientists in general. Most of them are pretty, not great people at one point or another. Fritz Haber in particular was a really not a nice person. There were actually a lot of the German scientists in the early 1900s. Um, it's not not a, a fun rabbit hole to go down to find all these people whose names show up in textbooks, just how many of them supported the Nazis. Um, but on the flip side, there were a lot of positive stories because there were a lot of Jewish scientists as well in Germany at the time. And there was a lot of positive stories um, about people helping people 
Um, but yeah, not for Tabor. Um, so here's a here's the schematic view of what he designed. Was basically he had this reaction happening, and then he had a built-in condenser that allowed the the um, the ammonia to condense, and then you had liquid NH three coming out the bottom, and all of the reaction was happening up here. So you never actually reach equilibrium. Um, and if this diagram is interesting to you, um, then you might think about going into engineering in some capacity because figuring out how to use the techniques that you have or what the science that's already there and create new things with it, that's all that, that's engineering 100%. Okay. Oh. He figured a way to scale it up. He found the catalyst that allowed the reaction to happen, but the problem is that the reaction happens only once you get up to about 550. So he built this whole elaborate system that allowed the reaction to happen over here, and then, but to take the gas that was made there and then kind of like move it back over to this section and cool it down. And so it was, it was not as simple as nobody understood Le Chatelier's principle. He figured out a way to allow the Le Chatelier's principle to keep working. Um, and basically indefinitely, you could just keep pumping in nitrogen and hydrogen gas, which were easy to make, um, and then keep this process going. Tosh? Right. Basically, all you're doing is you're, you never let it reach equilibrium. If you don't let it reach equilibrium, the system continuously is trying to reach equilibrium, making more product. And the same is true. It's the same thing that happens with uh, liquid water evaporating. What's the equilibrium expression for this process? It's the first rule of equilibrium. Products over reactants, right? And third rule is liquids don't count. So K for this process is just concentration of hydrogen as a gas. If you have a, a um, just a glass of water and you let it sit out for a week and a half, what happens to that water? It evaporates. It's try constantly trying to get to having a certain amount of gas in the, or sorry, water in the gas space. What happens to that glass of water if it's a water bottle and you put a lid on it instead? Does it evaporate? No, you reach equilibrium instead. You reach a certain pressure of water. And once you get to that certain concentration of water, you wind up with this process happening backwards and forwards at the same rate. If you take the lid off, you're basically letting all that water vapor escape. You're, you're removing the product from the system, which means you continually try to make more product to get to that equilibrium. So the reason that you never lose all the water in a closed water bottle, but if you take the lid off of it, it will eventually all evaporate, is also Le Chatelier's principle. It's the same idea. As you remove product, your reaction is going to continuously move forward to try and make more product unless it's a closed system. If it's a closed system, you eventually reach equilibrium. This just looks a whole lot more impressive than an empty water glass next to your bed, right? It's the same idea. Um, and this is some more some slides talking about the same thing we ended talking about. If we have an exothermic or an endothermic reaction. This one's a really interesting one because um, cobalt and cobalt chloride are different colors when you put them in water. This is an equilibrium reaction um, that is, let me see, this one is endothermic. No, exothermic. Um, this is an exothermic reaction. And, and if it's exothermic, that means that Energy is a product or a reactant? It's 
if it's exothermic, we're giving off energy, right? So energy is a product. So if we have cobalt two plus plus four chlorides in equilibrium with this cobalt fluoride ion plus energy. If we're at equilibrium and then we take energy away, we're gonna shift towards the product side. We're gonna make more product. This one's an interesting one because cobalt ions in water on their own are that sort of purpley blue color, but the cobalt chloride is pink. And so if you do this reaction at room temperature, you get an even mixture. It's kind of a purple color. If you heat it up, if we're at equilibrium and it's purple, and then we add energy in, which way is it going to go? We're adding product, it needs to shift back to the reactants. And so it goes from being purple to being blue. If we do the exact opposite, we take the same beaker and we add and we cool it down. Cooling it down means we're taking energy away. So it's gonna shift this way. So we can actually get control the color of these of this um, system by changing the temperature, which is one of the ways things like those stick-on thermometers work. You ever seen those like on the outside of a fish tank or something like that? Um, they work because they have something, an equilibrium process like this that has a color change associated with it. A different color means a different temperature. All right, one more experiment, thought experiment using the Haber process. What happens if we're at equilibrium and we change the volume? If we increase the volume, we're changing all those concentrations, right? So let's say we have K and it's concentration of NH2, NH3, to the two over a concentration of, of hydrogen cubed concentration of nitrogen. If we increase the volume, let's say we doubled the volume, what happens to all of the concentrations? They're all halved, right? So in the interest of making this easy, easy numbers, Let's say that we started, the concentration was one for all of them. We, and then we double the volume. Now we have a concentration of 0.5 for all of them, right? Well, if we started with a concentration of one for everything, we had a certain ratio it was just one over one at that point, right? If we do one half, if we plug one half in for each of these, it's no longer equal to a ratio of one, right? Is this gonna give us something that's bigger than one or less than one? Bigger than one, right? Cause we're gonna get, we can just cancel these this one out with two of those and we're gonna get one over 0.5 squared, right? Which is one, one over a quarter, which is four. We get a number that's bigger than one. It's not the same ratio. Because we have more molecules on this side than that side, one, of, one side of the reaction is affected more by increasing the volume. So if we increase the volume, we drop the concentration, 
which way is the equilibrium going to shift? You could also continue the same if you want to look at it mathematically. We had a four, right? And initially, our constant, our K was one. So products over reactants, we have too much product now. We need to shift back towards more reactant. And the way to think about this is if you drop the concentration of everything, you're going to switch, you're going to move your equilibrium to the side that has more molecules. Because the side that has, that's basically think of it as filling the empty space. We dropped everything's concentration. And so we need to fill that empty space more now. And so it's going to shift to the side that has more pieces. And the opposite is true as well. If you press down on it, if you decrease the volume, the concentration of everything goes up. So it's going to shift to the side that has fewer molecules to try and undo that process. All right. Let's talk a little bit, we mentioned catalysts a little bit in this class. Catalysts make it easier to get to equilibrium, but they don't affect the energy of your products or your reactants. Catalysts don't get used up as part of your reaction. That's what makes them a catalyst and not part of the reaction itself. If you add a catalyst to a system, it helps you get to equilibrium faster. But if you're not changing these relative heights, the difference in energy between reactants and products, you're not actually going to affect equilibrium. I don't usually hear that over here. So we're going to talk, when you take gen chem, you'll, there'll be a whole section on rates of chemical reactions. Catalysts affect rates dramatically because a rate is how fast do you, does a reaction happen? But as far as figuring out how much reaction happens, they don't make a difference. They can just make it easier to get there. For now, though, we're not really talking about catalysts too much. The, the bullet point, though, is just right here. A catalyst does not affect equilibrium. Not even really a good everyday example for using catalysis that I can think of with everyday application. Anyway, we will move to the other slides now. All right, so. Tomorrow's uh, tomorrow's lab, we're going to start looking at gases. And like I mentioned before, we're not going to do a full lecture on gases before you, you do this. Okay? So... I guess the best the best analogy I have is if you think about about energy for molecules like being altitude. Let's say I've got a I've got a car that it's an old car and it can't go above eight thousand feet in elevation because otherwise the engine just stops working. I can't take that car from Incline Village to Reno over Mount Rose because Mount Rose is above eight thousand feet, right? I can take a different route to get there though, right? If I go through Spooner and then go through Carson, then I never hit a, get above 8,000 feet. That's like the catalyst. The catalyst makes it so that you can get around these big barriers, but it doesn't change your overall change, your final minus initial change in altitude. Me going from incline to Reno is still the same overall change in altitude but I've just took a shortcut to get there without going over 8,000 feet.
fact that everybody around here understands altitude and passes actually makes that analogy work a lot better. If I tried to use that in San Diego, nobody would have any idea what I was talking about. Right. Enzymes take reactions that are already downhill in energy, but are hard to get to, like my car that can't go over Mount Rose. The enzymes make it so that they can get around, they give them a shortcut. You're still limited by equilibrium. You still can't make molecules um, that defy equilibrium, but you can make normal reactions that wouldn't happen at body temperature happen by allowing them to, to go around a barrier. That's why we die when our body temperature drops too, right? Because that activation energy changes and our enzymes can't work anymore. Dropping the temperature. So biology, I hesitate to say yes about anything when it comes to biology. Um, that's why that's why burns happen is because you start denaturing proteins in your skin. I don't know if there's something else at the organismal level, but yes, your your enzymes stop working so well when they get too cold because they they're not only do are you changing it so the reactions can't happen as well and changing that equilibrium but you're also denaturing the, pro the enzymes, which means you're changing their ability to, to act as a catalyst as well. Um, that's certainly part of it. I'm trying to think of what else. They always just say the cause of death was hypothermia, but that I don't know actually what the mechanism of hypothermia is. Is that why like when you cook food, it's like it's sort of shrink? Is that, sorry, say that again? Like when you cook food, shrinks down is that part of that so we cook food why do we cook food in general why do you cook meat why don't why don't we eat raw chicken because it's salmonella food foodborne pathogens right cooking things with by any means is basically just a way to denature foreign proteins and foreign viruses so that they don't infect us right the same thing happens with fish um or shellfish or beef, anything, any type of meat, really. We don't have to worry about it so much with plants, which is why you can eat vegetables and fruit raw, but you can't with meat. Um, and when you're cooking it, you're, it's more about denaturing those, those things, basically breaking those enzymes apart and breaking those other, those, that foreign DNA apart slightly so that it doesn't affect you as much. I believe volume is mostly just water evaporating. Um, I think I think if you did something like put a put a um, corned beef into a slow cooker and keep it submerged in water, if you boil meat, it'll still denature, but I don't think it changes the volume of the meat as much. But that's my that's my gut instinct. I don't know that that's accurate. Also brings up the other the other way of cooking food, right? is not by using heat, but by using acid. Ever, anybody ever had ceviche? Ceviche is not cooked fish technically, but it is. You don't have to worry about foodborne pathogens in ceviche. You just use acid to denature all of those foreign pathogens instead of using heat to do it. Pickling things too, right? Although pickling is different because if you do a true pickle, then it is a fermentation process. So you're just using one microbe to get rid of other microbes. Those are usually smoked and salted. So the smoke, the heat and the smoke kill the pathogens and the salt keeps them from coming back. All right. Let's do a thought. Go ahead, Tosh. No, no, no. We got we got time. Mm -hmm. So that's that's what Josie was just asking about. Like um, a lot of cured meats, especially smoking them. Sometimes the smoking is just a slow way of cooking it, and then um, between. And so most microorganisms don't grow well in really salty environments, or at least most microorganisms grow e either in a salty environment or in an unsalty environment, but not in both. So if you start from something that's not salted and then you salt it and then smoke it,
that's usually enough to preserve it so that it doesn't wind up anything that was in there is now dead and then it stays good longer because nothing's going to start growing in it once it's that salty um it's the same reason we can't drink salt water we can't drink salt water because our our cells have to maintain a constant amount of water a constant concentration relatively speaking inside the cell and so normally when we drink water our if we drink any um any salty water we actually wind up pulling moisture out of our cells because water naturally moves towards the less concentrated side um or tries to even out the concentrations so you wind up moving water out of the cells in into the salt water to try and even out those concentrations um and the same is true if you drink water that has no minerals in it you're, you actually wind up with too much water going into your cells. Your cells are constantly pumping water in and out to try and maintain a certain level. And if you get too far away from that normal level of, of saltiness, um, then your cells just can't keep up and they just wind up dying. Either get dehydrated or they explode if they can't keep the water from going in. Yeah. Yeah, so same, same issue. Um, we're just larger organisms, so we can handle a little bit more salt than most most microbes. All right, let's talk about pressure. I've been kind of dancing around this a few times because we've been dealing kind of with, with gases a little bit in terms of equilibrium, and we've talked a little bit about what gases are. Um, but what is pressure? Does anybody have an idea of what pressure is? Okay. Kind of. That's it's related to that. But what is that term? If you have a number of molecules, say how many moles you have in a certain space, what units would we put on space in that case? Like volume units, right? So you get molarity out of that. So that's concentration, but it's, it's close. It's related. Good. So it's like how much of something, like basically how much of something you have is like. It's close. It is, it's similar to a density, except that, and PSI is a good place to start with that, except that pounds, remember, isn't a mass. What is pounds? Who's taking physics? Pounds is a force, right? So at its most basic, Pressure in the physics terms is defined as a force spread out over an area. So force is literally just how much you can make something accelerate, how much you can change something's direction is defined as the force. So when we're talking about pressures in general, that's all we're looking at. And so, okay, well, I have something has this much force. I can push with a certain amount of force, a certain number of pounds. The amount I can push is just, is the force. The area that I use is what makes it a pressure. So, and we can kind of, the, the thought experiment that my high school teacher used is, has anybody ever had somebody walk on your back as a way, as a type of like back massage? It works pretty well if they're barefoot, right? Less so if they're wearing high heels. But why? They have the same, they weigh the same either way, right? It's the same force either way. What's different about somebody walking on your back in high heels versus walking on your back when it's barefoot? That area term gets smaller. When your area term, when the area term gets smaller, the pressure gets bigger. And in, in a lot of ways, this is also how a knife works. The reason that you can't use a hammer to cut something, even though you put maybe more force into it than you would into a knife, is because the knife has a very, very small area. And a really sharp knife has an even smaller area. So a smaller amount of force gives you greater pressure. Versus if you tr just try to use a rolling pin to cut something. Using a rolling pin, that doesn't even make any sense, right? 
in theory, if you swung that rolling pin hard enough, you could like, you know, cut something by just knocking it into pieces, right? But you have to use a whole lot more force to do it because the area is so much greater. And so how does this apply to gases? So, so think about filling up car tires or bike tires. When you put more gas molecules, what does that do to the pressure inside the tire? But why? You didn't change the area of the tire. But how? Say, say that louder, Kai. We're putting more air molecules inside. Each air molecule has its own force when it bumps into something, right? We're talking about a gas. We've got all these little tiny particles flying around in random directions. If we have a big container, what's happening when these gas molecules run into the side of the container? They're bouncing off, right? They're exerting force on the container by bouncing off. Well, every gas molecule, one gas molecule is not going to matter that much. Again, where are my physics people? What's the equation for, for force? I know some of you have taken physics, right? Force equals what? Mass times acceleration. Well, we have acceleration on these gas molecules when they bounce off and move the other direction, right? But their mass is really, really, really tiny. So each individual gas molecule can exert some force, but it's really, really, really small. And the area of the container is not really changing necessarily in this case. So go back to our bike tires analogy. What are we doing when we pump up the bike tire? We're increasing the pressure by doing what? Adding more gas molecules. So the total force goes up just because we have more individual collisions. All right, so this is why the at its the most the most intuitive ways of measuring pressure of a gas always look like a force unit divided by an area. So in in metric units, that's psi. Or more mathematically written, it's pounds over inches squared. Means the same thing though. What's the average number, the average force on every square inch of something? Does anybody know what that is at sea level? What the average force on everything just from the gas molecules at sea level is? One atmosphere, but in terms of pounds per square inch? It's about, I want to say it's 14.7. I'm not sure about the tenths place, though. That means at sea level, there's 14.7 pounds of force on every square inch of your body, which is weird. You have a lot of, you're a lot of surface area, a lot of square inches. How come you don't feel that? That seems like that's kind of a big number, right? How come you don't feel it? It always happens. And anybody scuba certified in here? What happens when you go when you go down underwater? You get pressed by even more, right? What happens when you're down low and you come up? It expands again, right? So the reason you don't feel 15 pounds on every square inch of your body at sea level is because your body's pushing back with the same amount. Now my swimmers, when you go down underwater, just like 12 feet and just hold your breath the whole way, you can still feel it in your ears, right? But you can't really equalize your ears if you're holding your breath, right? That's because you need to be able, in order to equalize, in, they call it equalizing because literally you're just getting all of the gas pockets inside your body to the same pressure as the outside. So scuba diving, when you go down slow and you breathe continuously the whole time, you're allowing your body to go from 
14.7 pounds per square inch to 30 pounds per square inch to 70 pounds per square inch. That's why you go down slowly and you equalize your ears and your face the whole way. And you have to keep breathing the whole way so that your lungs can equalize the pressure that's inside of them. Um, really, really deep. So every, and again, it's been a long time since my certification class, but I believe it's every 12 feet is one atmosphere of pressure, roughly. Um, every 12 feet underwater that you go is about 14.7 pounds per square inch. And just as a hobbyist, not even being certified beyond just the basic level of certification, you can go down to about 100 feet. Um, and if you have specialized equipment and specialized training, you can go down 300 feet without, without too much trouble. I don't know what the record is for depth on scuba diving, but it's more than 300 feet, which is like, you know, a whole lot of atmospheres of pressure on you. If you give your body a chance to adjust to it, then you actually can, your body is pretty resilient to a wide range of atmospheric pressures. It doesn't handle the change well. If you went from sea level to 300 feet below water all at once, or if you tried to free dive that, and keep your, your mouth closed and hold your breath the whole time, that's a problem because you don't have the opportunity to equalize. Even worse though, is if you equalize low temperature and then come back up because then everything expands all at once and you wind up with things like um, nitrogen bubbling out of your blood. You have too much nitrogen in your blood when you're under a whole lot of pressure and it all they use the phrase, your blood boils. It's not quite that. Basically, you wind up with nitrogen bubbles forming in your bloodstream, which causes is exceptionally painful and causes a, causes strokes, as well as lots of um, you know, heart trauma um, uh, and permanent lung damage. That's if you've ever heard the phrase, the bends, getting the bends or getting bent. Um, a phenomenal Radiohead album the bends um that's what happens when you come up when you're equalized and you lose pressure interestingly enough it's the exact same thing that happens if you are exposed to a hard vacuum in space if you go from that from being inside a spaceship to losing all pressure your but your blood basically does boil and you wind up with all these bubbles forming and you wind up with your body basically going through huge trauma and shutting down um, like underwater welders will have to be water deep to kind of substitute nitrogen for helium, right? Why is that? So you need something to keep, even if you're equalized, you still need to keep it at, at a certain level, um, not be too high of a pressure. So you need a certain oxygen content, some molarity of oxygen, um, but you also need background gases. And helium just doesn't dissolve as well into the blood um, so that you can wind up with, with getting away. And that's, that's what some of that specialized training, right? Is that when you get from hunt at a hundred feet and you want to go deeper than that, usually you switch to a different mixture of gases, uh, nitrox, I think, right? Um, which has a different ratio of oxygen to nitrogen to try and counteract that. Also, because nitrogen, I forgot about nitrogen narcosis. If you have too much nitrogen in your bloodstream, it actually makes you dizzy um, and can cause like a mild high, um, which you don't want that in people that are, you know, 150 feet under the surface of the water. You don't really want them like getting high um, per se. So that's one way to avoid that is to not use nitrogen for long periods of time at, above a certain pressure. Yeah, okay. What's that? I mean, that's just a lack of, of blood flow usually. Um, nitrogen narcosis, that it, the poetic description of it is called Rapture of the Deep, um, which is also where Bioshock got the name for their city. The Rapture of the Deep is actually from nitrogen narcosis um, because it was a fever dream. It's very 
like on the surface libertarian, but really it's a critique of libertarian. I love Bioshock. It's a great, it's a great argument for video games as an art form. Is that like the same reason that people like stay at Yeah, so yeah, the question was about people getting ready to climb Mount Everest and staying at base camp for a long time before you go up. Part of that is to get your body used to the altitude. It's not enough usually for just to be a, two, a few weeks. Um, it turns out to be fully acclimated to altitude, even just an altitude like our altitude, it actually takes three to five years because your body, it's a series of equilibrium reactions. Your body starts producing more of this molecule called either 1,3-biphosphoglycerate or 2,3-biphosphoglycerate. They're both in biochem, but in different places. Um, but basically that binds to your hemoglobin that changes how well hemoglobin bond, binds to oxygen and it kind of fine tunes how well your body's able to take in oxygen and then release it to your muscles. And that process takes like three to five years. You can get adjusted to altitude mostly in a couple of weeks, better in a couple months, but truly adapted in about three to five years. Um, there's, that's one of the things that they, that they, they don't test for it, like, like doping or anything like that, but you can, um, I believe you can do that. I don't know of any research showing that there's any benefit to doing that. Um, because it doesn't actually affect your performance at sea level. Those last, that last little bit, the BPG doesn't really affect your performance at sea level. So like athletes don't really get any, that much benefit from it. It helps us in our everyday life being at, at altitude. Um, but anyway, all right, go ahead. I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that because the ratio of it's a nature versus nurture argument. Humans are not adapted genetically to living at high altitudes. And so genetically, we're all best predisposed to perform well at sea level. And I don't know if that's something that in utero, like the umbilical cord delivers excess amounts of BPG from the mother or anything like that, if you would be born with those levels, or if that's something that your body still would have to get used to. I don't know that. That is a good question. I had not thought about that before. If, if that discussion about 1,3 BPG is interesting to you, then maybe instead of engineering, you could look at biochemistry because my bio, upper division biochemistry course had an entire two or three chapters. It was like 60 pages just on hemoglobin and all the different processes of the human body that affect hemoglobin and its structure and its function. Um, partly because it's really, really well understood and partly just because it's a really, really sensitive um, process. There's a lot of things that affect that equilibrium. All right, we have another five minutes, which is perfect. That's about the right amount of time I wanted to talk about your experiment for tomorrow because I want you to go into it somewhat blind, knowing kind of what pressure is. Let's think about this theoretical situation. You've got a cylinder with a bunch that's sealed and has a bunch of trapped gas in it. If you push down on that cylinder, what should happen to the pressure? If pressure is force over area, we, th we think that intuitively, right? Why though? Mathematically or physically, what's changing? The area is decreasing. We still have the same number of gas molecules, right? Which means, and they're all still the same temperature, which means force is not changing. But if you decrease the volume, it's really the surface area that actually shows up in the pressure but if we decrease the volume, there's less surface area on the cylinder for those molecules to bounce off of, right? So same force on a smaller area, we would expect it as we decrease the area, pressure should go up. So that's what your hypothesis is for tomorrow. Your hypothesis is if we have a sealed container and we press down on it, we're actually going to be 
technically we're going to be increasing the pressure and then measuring the volume change. But in theory, if we start with a certain, you say 10 liters and it's at one atmosphere of pressure. If we cut that volume in half, we cut the surface area in half too. If we cut the, if we cut the surface area in half, what should happen to the pressure? It should increase, but by how much? We would expect it to double. If we cut it in half again, it should double again. And the other way, if we start with it and we increase the volume, we start with our cylinder, we pull on the on that, what's gonna happen? We're increasing area then, right? So pressure should drop. So we would expect to see something that looks like this, a function that looks like this. We've got volume versus pressure. What mathematical function does that look like? Somebody said quadratic, which would be, a, that'd be a parabola though, right? Exponential decay, exponential decay though, would be something like this. We have, what happens if we expand this infinitely? If we keep going, we keep increasing the volume, increasing the volume, increasing the volume, are we ever going to get to zero pressure? What is that? That's an asymptote, right? What'd you say, Scott? One over X. It's not an exponential because that exponential get it, it has an asymptote at Y equals zero, but we also have an asymptote at X equals zero, right? Because can you ever compress it enough to get to a volume of zero? What's gonna happen to the pressure if you keep increasing or decreasing the volume infinitely? It approaches infinity, right? As A gets close to zero, pressure approaches infinity. So it's a one over, we're expecting it to look something like this. You're going to actually do this experiment tomorrow and plot the data. The, pr the pressure units are a little bit weird. It walks you through some of the calculations. Hey guys. But that's what you're going to do. You're going to start by trying to create that graph. And then you're going to do something weird and you're going to plot pressure versus one over volume. Because if you plot pressure versus one over volume, you should get a straight line. If you do a good job on the lab and you're careful with your data. So that's perfect. Good job. Good questions. Thanks. That was fun. And have fun tomorrow. It's going to be mostly an Excel lab. Yeah, let me let me stop the recording real quick.